You can support In the Past Lane by telling your friends about the podcast. Studies show that the number one way people find new podcasts is by word of mouth. So please, talk it up. And if you can, give us a shout out on social media. Thanks. On November 30th, 1901, just two and a half months after becoming president, following William McKinley's assassination, Theodore Roosevelt became the first U.S. president to attend a college football game. And not any game. It was the much ballyhooed annual tilt between Army and Navy. Roosevelt loved football almost as much as he loved the military, and it showed. He could barely sit still during the game, and he cheered wildly throughout it. On one particularly exceptional play, he exclaimed in the lingo of the day, Wasn't that tackle a sock dolliger? Then at one point, T.R. dashed down the bleachers and hurdled the fence to mingle with the Navy players and offer encouragement. The press and the crowd, at least those rooting for Navy, absolutely loved it. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more... Your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody's free until everybody's free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History's about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to In the Past Lane, the podcast about American history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, episode 173, in which we examine the significant impact Theodore Roosevelt had on American sports culture. We are brought to you by SBI, Snoring Beagle International, and come to you this week from the Tennis Cabinet Studios, located in central Massachusetts. You can learn more about me, this podcast, and our guests at our website, inthepastlane.com, and on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our YouTube channel. The Bill Belichick of this operation, complete with headphones, clipboard, and frowny face, is our executive producer, Lulu Spencer. So what's happening in In the Past Lane this week? Well, a lot, actually. First, I want to tell you about an upcoming podcasting conference that many of you educators out there might be interested in. It's called Sound Education, and it's taking place at Harvard University from October 9th through the 12th. It'll feature all kinds of talks and panels on all things audio, especially podcasting and education. So if you're curious about how you might get into podcasting as an educator, or how you can get your students to make podcast episodes, check it all out at soundeducation.fm. I hope to see you there. Also, I want to draw your attention to a new book written by a friend of mine, Linda Booth Sweeney. It's titled Monument Maker, Daniel Chester French and the Lincoln Memorial. It's a beautifully written and wonderfully illustrated book that's aimed at young readers. And it tells the story of one of the great American sculptors who created one of the nation's most iconic landmarks. So if you know any young readers and you're looking ahead to the gift-giving season, check out Monument Maker by Linda Booth Sweeney. And finally, I have a fairly big announcement to make. In a few weeks, I'll be pressing the pause button on In the Past Lane for about an eight-week hiatus. And I'm doing this for two reasons. First, I've been at this thing every week for almost four years, and honestly, I just need a break. After all, as you all know, I do have a full-time job as a college professor and lately as chair of my history department. And second, I have a documentary film project that I've made with my students that just simply needs to be finished. And we should be able to pull that off in just about eight weeks. So that's the plan. More details to follow. And I thank you in advance for your understanding. Okay, people, time to get into your workout outfit because we're going to get sweaty. Your journey in the past lane begins now. To say that the U.S. is a sports-obsessed nation would be an understatement, to say the least. Just consider some numbers. In 2019, the four major sports leagues, NFL, MLB, NBA, and NHL, will rake in revenues of almost $30 billion. In 2019, Americans will illegally bet more than $150 billion on college and professional sports. And this year, about 45 million children in the U.S. will participate in competitive sports. I could go on, but you get the point. All this obsession with sports raises an interesting question. How did it happen? 
Well, as we know, historical trends are always driven by multiple causes. And in the case of our obsession with sports, one of those factors was the influence of Theodore Roosevelt in the early 20th century. While we often associate Theodore Roosevelt with military exploits in the Spanish-American War and efforts to conserve the environment and natural resources, and his struggles to enact progressive social legislation, Theodore Roosevelt should also be remembered for his promotion of sports and physical fitness. To tell us more about this aspect of Theodore Roosevelt, I am joined today by Ryan Swanson. He's an associate professor of history at the University of New Mexico. He's the author of several books on sports history, including When Baseball Went White, Reconstruction, Reconciliation, and Dreams of a National Pastime. He's with me today to discuss his latest work, The Strenuous Life, Theodore Roosevelt and the Making of the American Athlete. In the course of our discussion, Ryan Swanson explains how Theodore Roosevelt used athletics to overcome childhood infirmity, including asthma. How this story of Roosevelt remaking his body as a young man became a key part of his public persona as a man of strength, zeal, courage, and accomplishment. Why Theodore Roosevelt and many other Americans in the Gilded Age grew concerned that the nation was growing soft and effeminate, and convinced that one solution, short of war, was athletics. How Roosevelt used tennis during his presidency as a way to stay fit and to conduct his personal brand of politics. How Roosevelt's love of football helped save the game when critics condemned it as dangerous and called for its abolition. And how in Roosevelt's day, promoters of physical fitness created the bond between education and sports that still exists to this very day. Ryan Swanson, welcome to In the Pass Lane. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. The title of your book refers to a specific phrase coined by Theodore Roosevelt, but it also, broadly speaking, captured the essence of TR's public persona, you know, as a man of action, strength, and zeal. But that's a style that TR carefully and consciously developed. He didn't start out that way. And I think our listeners would find it helpful and enlightening to hear about the young, sickly, feeble Teddy Roosevelt and how he used sports to basically remake himself. That's right. I mean, we do, you know, certainly his contemporaries when Roosevelt's in the White House enjoy thinking almost of a caricature of Roosevelt as this strong, rugged guy. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the, the beginning of his interest in athletics and sports is rooted absolutely to his childhood years. So when Roosevelt is a child between ages three until he hits his teen years, he suffers from just a terrible case of asthma. And, you know, most of us have some experience with asthma, either ourselves or people we know. But don't think of this as, you know, the kid who, you know, maybe needs an inhaler, just has a bit of breathing problem. Not that those aren't problems, but Roosevelt really has kind of a crisis on a daily basis. He cannot breathe. He has these panic attacks. And it really dominates his childhood. Mm -hmm. So much so that, you know, he doesn't play outside a whole lot. His family tries to put him in school, but that doesn't work because he has these panics so much. So he's tutored for most of his, his early years. And so Roosevelt is, is a sickly, weak child. And certainly that's the way he remembers himself when he gets to adulthood, too. So it becomes mm -hmm. even, even more prominent in his memory. But, and the family tries everything they can do to help get him better. Um, but unfortunately, abuterol inhalers, which are the key aid today, those don't get invented until the 1950s. So if mm -hmm. you had asthma during the middle of the 19th century, first of all, people thought there was something wrong with you on a kind of character emotional right. level. Asthma was believed to be, yeah, something that was conjured up to a certain extent. There was, you know, it was an understanding that there was something going on in the lungs and, and breathing ways, but asthmatic children were oftentimes assumed to be trying to get out of schoolwork or going to mm -hmm. church or, you know, so the, the idea was there was something wrong with them on that level too. So family tried, you know, shock therapy, bloodletting. They had him smoke cigars as a child. They would take him on these late night rides in the winter night. Nothing really worked. You know, kind of at the end of his, his childhood years, the family had settled on coffee, you know, right. a caffeine stimulant. That worked as well as anything, but it didn't work that well. So after going through a decade of that, the family's basically had enough, and in a story that's been widely recounted by historians, because Roosevelt liked to tell it so much, Roosevelt's father sat him down for a father-son chat as he hit his teen years, and his sister was there too, so we have another account of it. But to paraphrase, basically, Roosevelt's father said to his son, you know, he's proud of him. He's, you know, you're well-spoken, you're smart but you're not going to amount to anything if you don't make your body. You know, you have the mind, he says, but you have to make your body. And I have kids. That doesn't seem to me like an entirely fair thing for a father to say <laughs> to a son. Yeah. You know, right? Like, cure your own asthma, basically. Right. But Roosevelt takes it in, and he, at that moment, makes a commitment to his father. He says, I'll do it. I'll make my body. Now, what he meant at that moment, it's hard to say, but the way it plays out after this is, 
he really jumps heavily into athletic training, boxing, wrestling. His father, you know, the family's wealthy, so they build him basically a gymnasium in the home. They mm-hmm. get him boxing tutors. So he has everything, you know, a rich young kid could want. But he does, he does his part too. He works hard. He trains. And, you know, in, in Roosevelt's mind, almost a miracle occurs. He is cured, basically. It never goes away completely, but basically cured of his asthma. And Roosevelt will absolutely assume that those two things are connected. I worked out and I trained, therefore I got better and I got stronger. Yeah. Now much, you know, it's pretty widely understood today that it's common for kids to age out of the worst of asthma as they hit their teen years. But for Roosevelt, he made this this real causal connection, which will shape the way he thinks about athletics, you know, heading into adulthood and into the presidency. So yeah. like you said, I, I think that's where it all kind of starts. Yeah, I teach a course called Teddy Roosevelt's America. So we often Mm -hmm. talk quite a bit about Roosevelt. And one of the most fascinating discussions I have every semester that I teach this course with my students is saying, you know, making them think about Roosevelt's story as his own version of the self-made man. He Mm -hmm. he's born into privilege, so he can't claim that like Andrew Carnegie or somebody else that he came Mm -hmm. from nothing and built himself up. But he does have this self-made medical story, which I think uh, becomes an important part of his, you know, can do persona. Absolutely. I think he'd like to be Lincoln, you know, from from nothing to greatness. But when your family owns, you know, major chunks of Manhattan real estate and, a, you know, a, a glass importation company, I mean, the family's New York City rich. You can really not make that very well. So but athletics, he does he does build himself up. And so he uses that narrative, like you're saying. Yeah. And boxing seems to be the one sport that I mean, he's interested in lots of things, um, but boxing becomes a key part of his athletic uh, repertoire. And he takes that with him when he heads off to Harvard in the late 1870s. Tell us about how boxing plays a key role in his, as his kind of go-to sport. Yeah, boxing is growing in different ways during the middle of the 19th century. It had been popular in terms of championship fights and gambling sometime before this. But as the United States is you know, heading into the throes of urbanization and industrialization, boxing gyms open up in cities, both for competition but also as a means to train kind of the new middle and upper classes. And so Mm -hmm. for Roosevelt, when he's going to, you know, get his act together physically, make his body, as it were, boxing becomes a real useful outlet for that. So he is trained by a number of different championship fighters who become known as professors of pugilism. You know, they take Mm -hmm. on this air of respectability um, that that boxers hadn't had. And, you know, this is well explained in books like Elliot Gorn's The Manly Art, but Mm -hmm. Roosevelt comes into this, this boxing world and it means something to him personally. Uh, he works hard at it. He wins a couple of minor championship trophies early in his struggle, and I think that's really important for him. Uh, you know, I mentioned in the book, I think a lot of us have some minor athletic achievement in our past that really we're right. embarrassed, that we're so proud of, but we're still proud of it. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, I've got a three inch hockey championship trophy somewhere on, I think, on one of my bookshelves. And it's, you know, from when I was 11. Uh, no, I think it was when I was 10. Uh huh. You know, Pee Wee Hockey Championship. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Still, still there. Yeah, I mean, so Roosevelt has that moment in boxing, and, and I think that makes him relatable. On the one hand, the guy's, you know, Nobel Peace Prize and all these books and president and all that stuff, but he's relatable in athletics, which I think makes him interesting. So boxing becomes this avenue, and then when he gets to Harvard, you know, he's not, he's not going to make the football team. He's not going to row for the crew team or baseball. You're not going to be on the baseball team. He's not good enough for that. But the boxing gym is a place he can go daily and still continue to pound away at getting better physically. All the while, he's, you know, making friends and connections and developing intellectually at Harvard. And then from Harvard, he goes on and takes it, you know, when he runs for office, he boxes as governor and president. So I think, yeah, absolutely. Like you said, boxing is, you know, from a participation standpoint, really important to Roosevelt. Right. And it fits right in with maybe now is a good time to talk about the f- the title of your book, The Strenuous Life, which is a phrase that Roosevelt coins. And it, as you point out, it comes from 1899 and it comes from a speech that is mostly focused on militarism and, and foreign policy. But a lot of the phrases and a lot of the ideas in that speech are easily translatable to just the domestic sphere and what kind of what Americans should be just in terms of their overall uh, character. So tell us about that phrase, the strenuous life. Yeah, the strenuous life, as you said, 1899, Roosevelt comes back from the Spanish-American War, his brief but important military service, and he's asked to give a speech. Uh, He calls it the strenuous life in Chicago. And it is, just as you're saying, it's a speech that doesn't directly have much to do with athletics at all. It's an imperialistic 
you know, looking outward, where is the United States going to be in the coming years? Uh, it's got kind of some social Darwinist undertones to it. Mm-hmm. But given Roosevelt's interest in athletics and connection to sports, the, the phrase itself, the strenuous life, is basically co-opted by people interested in growing athletics. And the strenuous life comes to really be connected to physical toil and, and mm-hmm. athletic work. And so, you know, I, I make the loose connection that, you know, once a phrase is out there, it kind of has its own life. And so just do it, you know, Nike's phrase of, mm-hmm. I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, you know, was co-opted by all kinds of things. And it became more than just a, you know, a way to sell sneakers. It was about, you know, getting out there and living an adventure-filled, fearless life. And so that's the strenuous life. And with all the changes that are happening in the United States during Roosevelt's era, the strenuous life comes to kind of connect with individuals on on this idea that I've got to I've got to live my own life in an aggressive way, physically as well. Right. And I think that's an important theme in that Gilded Age is this, you know, as America does become more urbanized and more and more people are working in offices, there is this broad social fear that the nation is in danger of becoming effeminized and becoming weakened. And Roosevelt's very much a a spokesperson for that fear and presents both war and athleticism as as the antidote. It's, uh, It's really fascinating. And it does coalesce with um, the ideas of social Darwinism. You know, the key phrase of social Darwinism is the survival of the fittest. Survival of the fittest, of course, is, you know, it has broad meaning, but it mm-hmm. you could easily see it as an athletic term. I mean, if you're physically fit, you're a good athlete. Yeah. So let's turn now to his time in the White House. Roosevelt carries into the White House this dynamic personality. He's the youngest person to hold the office at that point, and not only continues to box, but also... Uh, builds up his his tennis game, or at the very least pursues his tennis game by literally building a tennis court. So tell us how tennis becomes that other sport that's important to Roosevelt personally, and it's also part of his way of doing politics. Yeah. When Roosevelt comes into the White House in 1901, after McKinley's assassination, just from a, a structure standpoint, the White House is in terrible need of repair. The place is basically a fire hazard with all sorts of wiring issues. It's mm-hmm. been, it, it's become really cramped because, you know, the White House was set up, you know, how long before this, 100 years before this or so, with a really, you know, different set of needs. There's no place for the press. There's offices kind of interspersed with the living areas. So Roosevelt, one of the first things Roosevelt does as president is he gets $600,000 from Congress to redo the White House, which, you know, I don't know about you, but that seems like a pretty risky political move today. It wouldn't go over well, right? Oh, absolutely. (laughs) He's got six kids and he needs more space. And a tennis court is put in just outside of the executive office of Roosevelt's office, where today the Oval Office sits. And there's a bit of debate among people who are really into this stuff about whether Roosevelt wanted it or whether it was his wife, Edith, who was kind of giving him some spousal nudging. Roosevelt's always battling his weight, so it seems plausible that Edith wants him, like, to have a tennis court right outside to remind him to get out there and sweat a bit. But, Mm -hmm. yeah, this tennis court is put in place just mere feet from where Roosevelt works as president. And it becomes really important for him. He plays as often as possible. Rarely does Mm -hmm. a week go by where he doesn't get a match or two in. And he plays with his own kind of unique style. It's a really aggressive, kind of straightforward style. He's not a great player. Right. You know, leave it to your daughter to say something, but his oldest daughter will come out and say several times, my father basically tried hard but wasn't good at tennis. Right. (laughs) What he he lacked in skill, he made up for in zeal. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. Yeah. Faint praise, but probably a very apt description. Mm -hmm. And so he does play, he plays a lot of tennis. One thing it is clear he also, you know, he plays tennis with his children and with anybody he can, mm-hmm. you know, he can get his hands on, but also members of his cabinet, visiting politicians. And what do you think it is? I mean, it's not just that he loves to play tennis. He loves mm-hmm. putting those people in that position. Also, yeah. when, you know, if it rains, he says, all right, let's drop the tennis and let's all go for a vigorous hike in the mud. <laughs> Tell us more about that yeah. style and what he, what it sort of suggests about his approach to human interaction with his political folks. So in addition to Roosevelt's official cabinet, he assembles a group that becomes known as the Tennis Cabinet. And it's 35 or so younger men from the civil service and, you know, a variety of different governmental positions, some of whom he actually knew back when he spends time in North Dakota. Uh, But these are a group of younger men who love to compete. And they're the ones who, if Roosevelt has a crazy idea, you know, it's a raw January day and he wants tennis, this is the group who he can get in touch with and say, how about some tennis this afternoon? And they're up for it. <laughs> yep. You know, so, and I think for Roosevelt, it is really 
it's yes, it's about the athletics. He's always trying to sweat and, and he's trying to kind of make up for sitting at a desk all day. So there is that component of it. He's always worried about his weight. Um, but it all, it's also a way for him to work through ideas and make connections. And so it is certainly a place where political decisions are being made and where he's getting advice. And so I think it's the way that he operates. And there are a couple of people that he spends you know, more time with than others. And one of them is the ambassador from France, uh, Jules Jusserand. Mm-hmm. And they become really close. And when Jusserand arrived in Washington, D.C., he was concerned that the British ambassador and the German ambassador had such a head start. They'd been on the scene for a while. They knew Roosevelt. But it only takes a couple of years before Jusserand kind of surpasses them because he's the guy who, no matter what Roosevelt says, you know, you want to go run through the mud or you want to play tennis in the cold or in the brutal heat of August, I'm game, I'm in. Mm -hmm. So he's always up for it, and he loves to talk about athletics and literature and kind of sweat it out while talking about these intellectual ideas. And so Roosevelt operates in this kind of sphere of physical movement and intellectual thought, and he's just got this voracious engine that is, is fueled by kind of bringing all those things together. Right. And it's clear he wants to transmit those values to the society at large. Absolutely. Yeah. The other sport that's important during his White House years is football, which itself is emerging as a great national sport, largely at the collegiate level. And Roosevelt never played football, but he loves football because it has certain things that appeal to him. It's very physical, violent, but it's also... And we see this today. It's very much tied or has, you know, militaristic styles and themes to it that he likes. It's two armies, you know, crashing together in the trenches. Mm -hmm. And so Roosevelt clearly loves football. He, as you note, attends the Army-Navy game and sort of gives the presidential seal of approval to the game. Mm -hmm. A couple of his sons play football. So tell us a little bit about why he likes football. But also, I think the, the key story here, at least one of the key stories, is in 1905, something that will sound very familiar to us today, which is that there was tremendous concern about how dangerous and how deadly 18 Mm -hmm. high school and college kids died playing football in Mm -hmm. 1905, that there was serious talk of banning football. And many schools did drop football for a while. But how does Roosevelt intervene there? Roosevelt loves the game of football as a spectator, primarily. And just as you've described aptly, he, he sees it as, in some ways, the best Thing a young man or group of men can have if they can't go off to war. And I realize that that sounds crazy and it, it gets at Roosevelt's warmonger side, but for, you know, so if you can't have war, football can be a, a substitute for that. And so Roosevelt's sons play football. Uh, Roosevelt himself never really did, uh, but he loves the game and he sees it as, yes, being violent and occasionally having these you know, side effects like someone's death, but mostly, you know, taken as a whole, it's really good for the development of young men and then good for the development of the nation as a whole. Mm-hmm. So in 1905, as you said, there's, there's a crisis. There had always been a lot of injuries in football and some deaths, but in 1905, there's kind of a crescendo of violence. And depending who you ask, there's a bit of debate over the number, but, you know, 18, 19, 20 young men die on the football field during that fall season. And this gives just even more fuel to the fire of the abolitionists. There's basically an Mm -hmm. abolition movement focused towards football. And the leader of this group is the president of Harvard, Charles Eliot, who is powerful and well-respected. And, you know, when the president of Harvard, which is the football school at this time, comes out and says, I want to get rid of football, it's, it's serious. And so he wants it he wants it done away with and Roosevelt will intervene. Roosevelt doesn't save football, I would argue, as has mm-hmm. sometimes been said, but he plays a role in getting people together to talk so that reforms can be made so that football does survive. And largely those talks are centered on changing rules. So what happens mm-hmm. there and then also isn't there a governance structure emerges at this time to kind of have a better a more firmer hand on college athletics. That's right. So Roosevelt, um, you know, after hearing about several particularly grievous injuries in in the fall of 1905, calls together the coaches and administrators of Princeton, Yale, and Harvard. And in today's context, that's basically reaching out to the leaders of Ohio State and Alabama and USC. Mm -hmm. You know, so these are the big guns in football. And he calls them to the White House for a meeting. And I think the fact that the meeting happens is perhaps as significant as anything. You have the president on one side, the secretary of state, and then all these football guys at a table Mm -hmm. in the White House. 
And so that in itself, I think, is probably the most important thing that happens that Roosevelt's directly involved in, because he asked them to make a series of changes, and initially they don't do much. They'll draft a statement after that meeting that says, basically, we will abide by the rules that are already in place, and we will penalize players who do, you know, kind of these grievous late hits and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But out of the White House meeting, a series of additional meetings happen. You know, in some ways, the story of football is the story of America. So there's a lot of meetings involved, yes. you know. <laughs> and it's the progressive era, too, which is, you know, there's yeah. deep belief in committees and convening experts and formulating plans. Yep, absolutely. Fits perfectly with that time. And so there's a series of meetings held and a couple of organizations are able to come together and agree to form a new organization, which becomes the NCAA. And so that organization starts in 1906. And out of the NCAA, you'll have inventions like the forward pass, and you'll put fewer people in motion at the beginning of a play. And mm -hmm. so you have fewer massive collisions, and the game gets a little bit safer, although not a lot. And so I would argue that it's part of this pattern football will have in the United States that's still going today, where there's this ebb and flow. The game gets a bit too dangerous, a bit too many concussions and deaths, and so there's a pushback, and we're going to change these rules. And then it goes for a few years, but the game always seems to survive and remain popular because it's violent, but you have to curb that occasionally. So this is a big moment in, in kind of that back and forth when the NCAA comes along. Right. And it's, as you say, not directly a product of Roosevelt's efforts, but it comes out of his broader support for college mm -hmm. athletics and football in particular. Yeah. And maybe we should, this is a good point to sort of widen the lens a little bit to get at your broader thesis in your book, which is, you know, this is an era in which more and more Americans are participating in sports and also mm -hmm. attending large sporting events. Mm -hmm. And the notion that there's value in athletics and tying athletics also to education, which is a very American mm -hmm. thing in this, in this era. Tell us about how this broad embrace of sports in the late 19th, early 20th century and maybe at one point address the emergence of the PSAL, mm -hmm. Public School Athletic League in New York, which really sets a model for this joining of these two ideals. Yeah. So as, as you well know, as you get you know, to the end of working on a project, sometimes it's hard to remember what it was you were going after when you started or you know, mm -hmm. what started me on this journey. But one thing I remember as I started this project was simply the question of you know, how did the United States get to the point we are at now when it comes to sports? You know, why do we have our kids in youth sports? Why are we so excited about the Super Bowl? What's the deal with the Army-Navy game? And then one of those questions additionally was, you know, why do we combine sports and education in mm -hmm. the way that we do in the United States? You know, occasionally I'll get a student in one of my classes uh, at the University of New Mexico who's from abroad. And they are kind of amused and amazed by the fact <laughs> that our universities seem to have all these sports and it's connected. And wait a second, your athletic budget is, you know, at UNM it's $35 million and that kind of blows their mind. And so yeah. figuring out where the connection between education and sports came from, there's no one answer. And college football is part of it, as I've already talked about. But I think, you know, another big part of it is connecting sports at a younger age to schools. And so, yeah. as you mentioned, the beginning of the Public Schools Athletic League in 1903 in New York City is pivotal in pushing us in this direction. So what happens there is, you know, again, thinking in the progressive era, and we're going to fix problems, and we're going to organize and get experts. In 1903, the school district in New York or the hires Luther Gullick who is a progressive reformer who believes that you can combine education and athletics in order to produce better citizens, basically. Mm -hmm. And so he comes in, and he's the director of athletics, basically, for the public school system of New York City, which has got about 600,000 children. And he's given a really impossible task. He's told, basically, to make these kids healthier. Mm -hmm. Because what's going on, actually, is people are looking around and seeing that despite all this advancement in industry and technology, our kids and ourselves don't seem to be as healthy as we used to be. You know, what's, mm -hmm. what's going on? And so Luther Gullick creates a physical education program for the schools of New York City. And basically, he's got two tenants of this system that he creates, or actually three. Uh, the first thing he does is he begins creating PE classes, which seem to actually, you know, if we think about our context today, seem to be having a bit of rebirth in terms of dealing with our obesity issues and stuff like that. Right. So, all right, we're going to have PE in schools. He does that. The second thing he does is he creates a, an incentive system for developing your physical abilities. So, you know, if, if perhaps you remember, as I do, the presidential fitness testing that we used to do. Oh, yes. Yep. <laughs> Good times, you know. Mm -hmm. You'd run a mile and you'd do a shuttle test and 
in my case, try to do a pull-up, those kinds of things, right? Mm -hmm. It's Golik that creates the first one of these on a broad scale. He creates a a badge system for every kid who is able to run the 60-yard dash this quickly and jump this far in the long jump and do these things, they'll get a badge out of it. And so he puts that in place, and that that expands. And then the third part of developing this school athletics um, paradigm, he develops interscholastic competitions. So basketball tournaments, track meets, baseball competitions, one school competing against the other. And the idea being you go to school to learn, of course, and to become a better citizen, but you also go to school to be physically active and maybe even to be part of a team. And so that has roots there in that first decade of the 20th century. And I think obviously given our our system today and the idea of a student athlete from first grade through college, that's that's got roots in, in Roosevelt's era and the progressive era. Yeah, and in some ways, because it happens, like a lot of things, like tenement reform and other things, if it happens in New York, it often gets more attention. Mm-hmm. And therefore, it's copied or, mod- you know, people borrow it and modify it. But the, the template, yep. in this case, comes out of New York City. And then, it, as you say, over time, it becomes something that we simply take for granted. I think mm-hmm. most Americans for decades have long thought of sports and physical fitness as part of their public education. Mm-hmm. Well, one thing that I ask all the historians that I interview, one thing that I ask is, how does this connect to our, our present moment? What's relevant about this topic today? And we've already touched on a little bit, but what do you see as sort of the key takeaway from your book, which is situated in the early 20, you know, literally 100 years ago, mm-hmm. and our current moment now when it comes to, well, where we are in 2019? I think there are a couple of places to start. One of them would be on the issue of parental angst, if I could say it that way. Mm-hmm. I've I've got three kids, ages nine to fourteen, and so I can relate to this personally. But I think I can talk more broadly than that about concerns among parents about our children growing up too soft. Right? Mm-hmm. You know what do they do? They've got their smartphones, and they're just inside all the time playing Fortnite, and they're not getting out and getting tough, and they're not used to. You know, everybody gets a medal. That kind of talk that is out quite a bit. Um, now is actually really similar to the way that parents and communities were feeling about their children during the progressive era, during Roosevelt's era. And so during that time, sports becomes a way to abate those fears. All right, your kids, yeah, your kids aren't out, you know, bringing in the harvest and milking the, you know, cows and doing that kind of stuff because you live in New York City, but you can put them on a team and you can make them sweat and they can they can experience competition. I think it's I think there's a lot that hasn't changed in terms of the way sports function to you know, help parents deal with what they see as deficiencies in our society. So I think that's a real a real similarity. Mhm. And, and then maybe, you know, if I've got time to share one more, I would say Sure that if the first one is really pointing to a continuity, I think one real change that we see now is the way that the White House and President Trump is using sports as compared to, say, Roosevelt. So Roosevelt kind of sets this idea of presidents espousing physical health and encouraging competition and being a sports fan. And that example really moves forward from Roosevelt kind of down the line. If we look backwards, you know, you think about Obama, President Obama, he was known to get out there and play some hoops at lunchtime, right? Right. And he filled out a March Madness bracket and did that. And before him, you know, President George W. Bush was a pretty avid runner and mountain biker. And on down the line, Clinton was a jogger, even if they made fun of him for shopping at McDonald's during his runs. And, <laughs> That's right. You know, and we've had some good presidential athletes, Ford and George Herbert Walker. Bush was a college baseball player. Ford was a college football player. So anyway, this paradigm has been in place, I think, really coming from Roosevelt. And I would argue that Trump is really doing something very different with sports. Right. His attitude towards athletics is quite striking mm-hmm. in, in contrast. Yeah, it's really different, really different. And this has nothing to do with partisanship or anything like that. But Trump has said that he basically believes that, you know, the human body has X number of heartbeats and that's it. I mean, he doesn't espouse really any sort of physical fitness regimen. And um, while he, oh, you know, he attends a sporting event here or there, it hasn't really been his thing. So this is a real departure in the way that sports has been used by a president. And among other things, you know, Roosevelt was one of the first presidents to greet sports teams at the White House. And we've seen that really become controversial here under Trump. So, you know, interesting to assess how that is changing here a bit at this time. Right. And there's a lot of, as you say, connections and and also some contrasts and also lots of other things. I mean, the, the last few years, there's been serious talk about paying college athletes. Right. And that, I think, would horrify somebody like Theodore Roosevelt, who believed Mm -hmm. in that, you know, amateur ideal. But Mm -hmm. 
the argument in favor of it is also quite persuasive when people look at the amount of revenue that the NCAA brings in and that mm -hmm. each of these programs. So there's lots of lots of interesting questions. Well, Ryan Swanson, this has been a great and very interesting. Anytime I get to talk about Theodore Roosevelt, I'm, <laughs> I'm always game. I find him endlessly fascinating and such a bundle of contradictions. And this is a really important dimension of his you know, his lasting impact on American society. So thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us at In the Pass Lane. It's been absolutely my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Ryan Swanson is author of The Strenuous Life, Theodore Roosevelt and the Making of the American Athlete, published by Diversion Books and available everywhere that books are sold. You can follow Ryan Swanson on Twitter at SwansonRyan21. Okay, past laners, as always, this has been a lot of fun. But alas, we are out of time. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to this podcast at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you access your podcasts. I'm in the past lanes host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world. So let's pay attention to it. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us next time for another journey in the past lane. Hey, Lulu. What do you think of all this talk about the strenuous life? I think I need to lie down. SBI, Snoring Beagle International.